Well, good morning and welcome this morning to our service. It's great to be able to be with you once again. And it's great to be able to continue on through our series in 1 John as this morning we look at the last chapter, the start of it, in verses 1 to 12. And we ask the question, what do you believe in? Well, as we open, let's pray together. Father, we pray that you'd be with us now, Lord. We thank you for the ability for us to meet, whether it be in person or digitally, Lord. We pray that you would be with us, that you would watch over us now, and that you would guide this meeting, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we have our normal week coming before us again, our Bible at bedtime each evening. On uh, Monday evening, we have our pick and mix, and on Tuesday morning, our pebble story time. On Wednesday night, we've just finished our series in Romans, and, and hopefully we'll be looking at the Sermon on the Mount going forward from this week. But the following Wednesday, we're actually going to be being joined by John Lutus, who will be coming to speak to us about the work that he's involved with. So do think about coming and joining us a week on Wednesday as we think about work that is going on there. And, and also on Friday we have our youth before we come back together next Friday for our final sermon in 1 John 5. Well, as we go into our service now, I'm going to hand over to the team as we spend a time hearing a song, spending time with the children's talks, the Bible reading, and a time of prayer. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your help and salvation. Oh, you who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad. children and we're looking at our lovely book again everything we need to know about God and um, we're just reaching the end of a section we'll be starting a new one next week but I was wondering have you ever seen um, those books I think Usborne do them there's one called 
the baby's first hundred words and there's another one called the first thousand words I think they're called that anyway I know I used to have them in my nursery years ago when I was a teacher of children with special needs and we'd all have a go at learning those very important words so there'd be words for everyday objects like um, table or cup baby teddy cat and as you got further into them, you'd get more difficult words, words like more and help and finish. And of course, I used to teach my children the signs for those. So it'd be table and cup and friend and girl and more. Um, but you know, all those words are very important, but there are two words we can put together. I'm sorry about the paint on my hands. I've been painting the garage. Um, there are two very important words that children put together and their parents are usually very keen for them to learn them. I wonder if you know what they are. Well, they're the words thank and you. And I used to teach my children thank you and there's a little sign as well for that. Thank you. Very, very important words that we can use if someone does something nice for us maybe or if somebody passes something to us that we can't reach or they help us with a problem. It's really important, isn't it, to say thank you. Do you know it's even more important to say thank you to Jesus and in our picture today we can see a little girl here and she's called Ashley they don't always have a name do they these characters in, in the book but there's Ashley and she's sitting down with her mum and they're praying together and in their prayer they're saying thank you uh, some people like to say thank you before they have a meal at home. They say grace. I wonder if you still do that in school. And we're saying thank you to God for providing us uh, with our dinner. But you know, the really important thing to say thank you to Jesus for is that he died for us on the cross. And we should take time to say thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross. It's a wonderful thing that Jesus did. And you know, one day, if we know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour, we will be very happy because we will be with him in heaven forever and ever. And we can say thank you to God for that and for making us part of his family, the heavenly family. So thank you, Jesus, for those wonderful things. Who was it? This is our question. Who was it that died so that our sins can be forgiven? That's right, it was Jesus. And that's why Ashley and her mum are saying thank you. And it's why we need to say thank you to, to Jesus for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to say a little prayer. And then I think we know a, a thank you song um, that we can sing together in our hearts at least, even if we can't sing out loud. So hands together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. Thank you that if we are his, one day we will be with him in heaven. Thank you if we are his, we are part of his great family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.
live the life that we were made for. One with God above, living as His children. We trust in His words, knowing You fulfill them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that You died for us. We will always thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Well, good morning. Let's all pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can turn to you now this morning with praise and thanksgiving for your greatness, your glory, your power, your might. We thank you that you are the great creator and sustainer of the ends of the earth and the fullness of the universe. All is in your hands, O oh Lord, and you rule and reign over every aspect, every atom of the universe. And we give you praise and uh, bow down before you, Lord, uh, for your uh, greatness and the majesty, O oh Lord, that is yours. We praise you that uh, though you are so great and so glorious in the heavens, yet, O oh Lord, you are concerned with the small details of uh, of all that you have made. Uh, not a sparrow falls to the ground without you knowing it, Lord, and every aspect of our lives is known to you and under your uh, control and influence. And we thank you, therefore, Heavenly Father, that as we turn to you this morning, we can have the confidence of knowing that we are loved and cared for and that you provide for us and you uh, uh, watch over us with uh, a, a Father's eye. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the, the greatness of the salvation that is ours in Christ. We thank you that we have been raised together with him to newness of life, and uh, we have this glorious hope of heaven before us, and uh, we can know your provision and your help day by day as we live out our lives here on earth. So draw near to us now, we pray, Father, that you will bless the day that lies ahead. Bless, in particular, Lord, the preaching of your word to us uh, through Ben this morning. We pray, Lord, that you will use him and that your word will come with power and with uh, authority. And also, Lord, uh, that it will help us to understand more of who you are and uh, Help us, O oh Lord, to love you more, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and to uh, work out our salvation daily uh, with fear and trembling. Lord, <coughs> send your spirit into our hearts, we pray, and help us to not only hear your word but also to apply it uh, in our lives. Continue with us as a church family. Watch over each one. We pray, Father, that you will help those who are uh, struggling with difficulties and problems in their lives and uh, help those, O oh Lord, who uh, are daily rubbing shoulders with uh, uh, unbelieving family and uh, colleagues in work or uh, in other uh, uh, circumstances. Lord, we pray that you will be with each one of us and help us, Lord, to maintain our witness and our trust in you. And uh, Lord, work through us to work in the lives of others, we pray. 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your uh, sustaining grace uh, to uh, each and every one of us. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we go forward as a church, so you will help us and uh, bless us and encourage us, particularly during this coming week, Lord, as various ministries take place. We pray, Father, that they will uh, be the means by which uh, we are built up in our faith, that uh, others are instructed in the Christian faith and that uh, your name is uh, glorified and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is uplifted. So, Lord, be with us now, we pray. We thank you again for uh, the uh, way in which uh, the virus is uh, uh, being uh, um, restrained and we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, the uh, powers that be uh, will have uh, uh, the ability to uh, help us through this time and to uh, restore to us uh, some uh, further freedoms, Lord, that we have missed over the past year or so. So, Lord, come to us, we pray now, and thank you once again for your uh, loving kindness and your tender mercies. Forgive our sins. Help us, O oh Lord, to uh, subdue uh, every uh, rising desire to uh, disobey, uh, but uh, to follow hard after the Lord Jesus Christ and all that we see and know of him. So hear our prayers now as we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's Bible reading is taken from 1 John, chapter 5, and reading verses 1 to 12. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Well, thank you. Well, let's pray as we come to these words. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this letter of John, Lord, and for all that we've seen so far. And now as we head into this final chapter, Lord, we pray that you will continue to teach us and challenge us this morning, Lord. We pray that you'd be with us now and you'd speak through us and you'd uphold me as I guide us through this passage, Lord. We pray that you would speak to our hearts now. Amen. Amen. Well, do keep those words open in front of you of this first half of chapter 5. Now, as we think about these things, we're going to be wondering, what do you believe in? And quite often we believe in things on authority, and that means that, that we believe in it because someone who is trustworthy told us. 99% of the things that we believe, we believe on authority. Now, I believe there's a place called New York City. Now, I've never been there personally, but I've seen photos, I've heard stories of what goes on there. So I believe that it is there. Now, I can't prove it because I've never been there, but I believe it on authority. 
I believe, as well as many people, or nearly all people, believe that there's a solar system in the way that it has been organized for us. There are atoms, there's circulation of the blood around our body. We believe these things on authority. We haven't seen them, but we believe the scientists who, who tell us. Every historical statement is believed on authority. None of us were there for the Norman Conquest. None of us saw the defeat of the Spanish Armada, but we read the books that have been passed down from them, and we believe that the people writing them were telling us the truth, that it is fact on authority. A person who resists authority in other things, as some people do in religion, well, would have to be content with not knowing anything at all in life, wouldn't they? So I wonder, why do you believe in... So I wonder, sorry, what do you believe in when it comes to our understanding of God? For we have been given a historical backing. We can see God's love. As we thought about in chapter 4, we have been given on authority information about who God is and what he has done for us. We have first-hand witnesses who were there, yet for some reason people class this as less reliable than the philosophers and the key thinkers who create theories based on abstract understanding. This morning, as we look at the start of our final chapter in 1 John, we're going to be thinking about faith. We are going to be thinking about belief and where our belief comes from. And as we explore this passage together, well, we'll be thinking about three things. A rebirth of God, the fact of history, and testimony of the scripture. And we'll be thinking about how this impacts our belief how we see it through history and how John speaks about it. And, and we're going to be asking, why should we take this seriously? Firstly, as we open, as we look at verses 1 to 5, we see a rebirth of God. A rebirth that we receive if we come to the Lord that is holy from Him. Now last week we thought about love. If you remember, in the end of chapter 4, we thought about love and how it pointed to God. And as we continue on, we see that that love leads on to a new life, a rebirth from God, one that makes us new. Now, earthly families, they are constantly changing year on year. It wasn't that long ago that single-parent families were only about 5% of, of all families, but the, last year they accounted for nearly 15%. The changes that we've seen to family dynamic have been huge over the last few years, including the rise in, in cohabiting or just simply co-parenting, the introduction of civil partnerships, and many other things that change the way families are. All earthly families, though, whatever kind they are, are hit by different issues. Some happy, some encouraging and filled with love. Other families that are very dangerous places for children to grow up in. And we, we've heard more and more about that horrible situation over lockdown, haven't we? Now, we can't pick and choose which kind of family we're born into on earth. But, as we continue through the passage this morning... We are shown that whether we have a good or a bad family on earth, there's a new family for the believer, a better family, one with God in eternity. And that is why we're going to be thinking about this rebirth. Look at verse 1 with me. Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God. John often mentions being born of God. We've already seen it in 1 John, chapters 2, verse 29, chapter 3, verse 9, and 4, verse 7. Here he tells us how one is born of God. Whoever believes in Jesus is born of God. That means believing in Jesus the Messiah. Not just the Messiah in a generic sense, but believing in Christ. Having been focused on love previously, he wants to make sure we know that, that we do not earn our own salvation. Rather, the, this salvation, this new life, this birth is only through Jesus' saving works. And, and with these words, we are being reminded of who Jesus is. He is the Christ. Additionally, John makes it plain. We must believe that Jesus is the Christ. There are many uh, of a New Age sort of thinking who believe Jesus had the Christ spirit. He, he was special in some way, but not necessarily God, as they claim also Confucius, Muhammad, Buddha, certain moderns did. They think that they also had the Christ spirit. But, but we would never say Jesus has the Christ. No, we say Jesus 
is the Christ. That's why he doesn't fit in with those other people. Because he was special. He is God. He is the Messiah. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. We see being born of God has this effect on us. The love that we thought of last week. We will love him, we will love Christ, and we will love others who are his children. These things will give us assurance of our claim of this rebirth. If we are filled with love for Christ and love for God's people, well, we are reborn in him. That is how we know that we are the children of God. And we will know it by carrying out his commands. How can we know we love someone? Well, in the world, we know we love someone by the way we treat them, don't we? We show it in the way that we live our lives. And, and we're shown that love through those things. M many people have tried to find out how we can know this in the world. They've used books about the, the five love languages. Maybe you've heard of that. It's all about the different ways that we feel and show love. But we don't need to know the love languages to know our love for God. As we see in verse 2, we can know our love for God by following his commands. This love for other Christians, it goes beyond the social barriers, beyond race, beyond political opinion or de denomination. This is a love for all Christians, and by loving them, we love God. And we thought about that last week, didn't we? Practicing love for God by loving his children. This is love for God to keep his commands, John points to us in verse 3, doesn't he? Following his command shows that we love him. If we follow the rules that are laid out for us by our parents or guardians, we show that we love and respect them. If we choose to ignore them, well, there is no love shown there, is there? It is the same when it comes to God. If we ignore his rules, then we cannot love him. If we ignore what he says, we reject him. That's what we're seeing here, isn't it? And you know what? When we love him, when we see his commands and we love him, they will not be burdensome, we hear. They are gifts from him to show us the best and most fulfilling way to live our lives. God... His commands are like the manufacturer's handbook for life. He tells us what to do because he knows how we work best. His commands are not given to bind us or cause us pain. They're not given because God is an irritated old man. No, they are given to help us. And when we are born again, we are given new hearts. Hearts with an instinct to please God, as part of the new covenant, the law of God has been written on the heart of every believer we hear in Jeremiah 31, 33. It's so different to the law of men, isn't it? Because the laws of men are sometimes hard to follow. They don't always look out for the best for people. They are selfishly written to help the person writing them keep their position. They are heavy and burdensome on the shoulders of those having to follow them. We can see this in the life of Jesus. The commands and the laws of the Pharisees, they were written and they were burdensome because they were not of God. When we love God, when we are reborn of him, we'll find that we have a desire to follow these laws regardless of how difficult it may seem on the outset. It will be easier for us. When we love someone, it seems little trouble to go to a lot of difficulty to help or please that person, doesn't it? You enjoy doing it. Though if you had to do it for an enemy, you, you would complain the whole time. Just as the seven years of Jacob's service for Laban seemed only a few days to him because of his love for Rachel, we see in Genesis 29 verse 18, so obeying God's command does not seem a burden when we really love him. The old proverb says, love feels no load. And when we love the Lord, that is how it feels. It feels easier. And everyone born of God will feel that easiness and will overcome the world, we see in verse 4. A victory that has overcome the world because of him. Do we believe in that rebirth? Do we believe in that victory? That's what we're being told here. There is victory in this rebirth and we must trust in God for that. We must believe in it since believing on him is the key to being born again. The key to victory is faith. 
Not only initial come to the altar and be saved faith, but a consistent, abiding faith, an ongoing reliance and trust upon God. And he wants to drive this home for us, doesn't he, John? In verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Who dis- defeats the world? Who gives this new life? Well, it is God. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The only ones who have this victory, the only ones who have this new birth, are those who have faith in God. Faith in Christ's victory and find rebirth in that. John here is pointing us to the things that we need to know as we walk in the world. We've been shown throughout this book so far that we should let go of the world. That we need Jesus in our lives for any kind of fulfillment. And now we are called to understand our need for a rebirth in him. Jesus tells us in John 16 that in the world there will be troubles and tribulations. But he continues in that passage to tell us that we have overcome the world through him. There's an offer. If you find yourself in him, you will overcome it. The rebirth is what we are hearing up here. A rebirth that gives us great strength. One that comes through faith, one that we need so dearly. So do you believe in the one who offers the rebirth? Do you believe in this rebirth that is of God? That's our first question. But as we continue, that's not all we're being asked this morning. As we look at verses 6 to 9, we're also asked, do you believe in the facts of history? The facts of history in verse 6 to 9. C.S. Lewis once looked to help us understand a little more about the price that Jesus paid. The great act of the cross. The great act of coming down in human form. He said it this way. Imagine for a moment that your dog and every dog was in deep distress. Now some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world to become like men, would you be willing to become a dog, he asked. Would you put down your human nature, leave your loved ones, your job, your hobbies, your arts, your literature and music, and choose instead of the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into your beloved's face with a wagging tail, unable to smile or speak. Christ, by becoming God, a man, limited the thing which to him was the most precious thing in the world. His unhampered, unhindered communion with the Father. The facts of history are that Jesus came down in the form of a man. It is seen in the Bible, it is documented by historians like the Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus. And as we continue through this passage, we are called to look at the facts of Jesus' physical existence by John. Look here as we look at verse 6. This is the one who came, the one who brings this victory, the one who brings this rebirth. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. As John continues to point to Christ, he reminds us of the facts of his life. John makes it clear that Jesus that he is speaking of is not the Gnostic phantom Jesus who was so holy that he had nothing to do with the world. This Jesus that we must believe in is the Jesus who came in water and blood. The Jesus who was part of the real material flesh and blood earth. John returns to a theme he started at within the beginning of this letter. The real historical foundation of Christ. In 1 John 1, 1 to 3, the emphasis was on what was seen and heard and looked upon and handled. Real stuff, real people, real things. Just like water and blood are real, so was the coming of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That is the one we're speaking about. Not the one who came as one or the other, but the one who came in both. There had been a problem with the opponents of the church. They couldn't accept that Christ could die. So they questioned the validity of Christ. John here is pointing to Christ's work throughout his whole life, from birth to death, totally God totally man. Some taught and still teach that Jesus received the the Christ spirit we thought of before. That he received it at his baptism 
and then it left him before his death on the cross. They, for them, they think it's unthinkable that God could hang on the cross. But John insists that Jesus did not only come in the water of his baptism, but in the blood of the cross. He was just as much the Son of God on the cross as when the Father declared at his baptism, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. In Luke 3, verse 22, there was no difference. We may find it difficult to relate to this ancient manner of trying to avoid the offence of the cross by saying, well, it really wasn't the Son of God who hung on the tree. But in our modern age, we have our own ways of trying to avoid that offence of the cross, don't we? Some deny Jesus was God at all. They think of him as a noble martyr. Some trivialise the cross, making it a mere ornament to wear around your neck or a pop fashion trend. Others replace the cross with a self-help book or self-esteem gospel of, of psychology. Well, they use a crossless evangelism so not to offend the people around them. But it is the Spirit who testifies, the Spirit of truth, that Jesus was the real one who came. We know all this because the Holy Spirit informs us. For these are three that testify, he says, as we move into verse 7. The facts that, that we have been shown, the witnesses that have brought these things here point to, to further witnesses being the Spirit, Jesus' life, and his death, the, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, he says in verse 8. There is no difference between the message that we see in Jesus' life to any of these other things. For in his life, we, we see that he is the Messiah, the one who brought, who was sent by the Father. In his death, we see that he is the Messiah who came to die on the cross. And, and the Spirit, at his baptism, and as he continues to work in, in God's word now, tells us that these things were true. The spirit, the water, the blood, they all point to who Jesus was and, and point us to the truth that he was truly man and truly God. We accept human testimony, um, John says in verse 9, because we do, don't we? We're happy to listen to what people say. We wonder about what people say about daily, day-to-day -day things, don't we? And we listen to them. We say, well, you are trustworthy. But here he says, it's not just a man. It's not just a person who says that Jesus was really who he claimed to be. No, it was God. God's testimony who points to Christ. God's testimony who tells us who Jesus was. Everybody, every day, receives the witness of men regarding various things. And if we believe in them, well, how much more should we believe in God? The one who pointed to who Jesus was. The one who spoke about who Jesus was. And the one whose word continues to elaborate on who Jesus is. We must come to the word about Jesus that we find in the Bible and know where these things come from. The Bible is a book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Written by humans that God chose to use. These words about Jesus, they're not like the testimony of someone in a courtroom. Rather they are from God. And God does not lie. The one who is trustworthy and true is God. And we should believe in all that he says. We can see the truth in them. Through the works of Jesus' life, the death alongside the word, words of God's word. For, for they all align together. We have the Old Testament that points forward to the one who will come. The Christ who will fulfill all of these promises. We have the New Testament that tells us about these fulfillments. So believe not just in the rebirth that comes from God, that is seen in the love we have, but also in the facts of history that are seen in the Bible. And finally, as we look at our next section, verses 10 through to 12, we, we've been building to these final few verses. And here we are called also to believe in the testimony of Scripture. The testimony of of scripture. People's testimony often show that they have changed, don't they? 
When we hear people's testimony of how they came to the Lord, we hear about the way that they lived different lives after. When native converts on the island of Madagascar used to pre present themselves for baptism, it was often asked of them, what first led you to think about becoming a Christian? The answer usually was that there was a change in the conduct of others who had become Christians that first brought them to, to see this new life. Someone said, I knew this man to be a thief, that one to be a drunkard, another to be very cruel and unkind to his family, but now they are all changed. The thief is an honest man, the drunkard, sober and respectable, the other gentle and kind in his home. There must be something in this religion that can change people in such a way. These people, they had been impacted by the testimony of other people's lives. But here we are called to believe in something greater than that. We are called to believe in the testimony of God's word itself. Look, as we, as we continue in verse 10, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. The testimony that we heard about is true and we must hear it. We must allow it to impact us deeply. When we believe on Jesus, we receive the Spirit as an inner confirmation of our standing before God. And whoever does not believe it, well, they make God out to be a liar, he says, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. When we refuse to believe on Jesus, we reject God's testimony. We call God a liar in our unbelief, and, and what a dangerous thing that is to do. It isn't simply saying that God can exist out there, but I don't need him in my life. If you don't follow Jesus, if you don't trust in the Bible, you are saying that that God who you says can exist out there, the one who is above all things, is a liar. And you stand directly opposed to him, calling him a liar. Uh, uh, there is no middle ground there. You can't just step out of the equation. You either stand with him or you reject him and call him a liar. Spurgeon said, John here exposes the great sin of unbelief. Most everyone who refuses to believe in God in the full sense of the word belief doesn't intend to call God a liar, but they do it nonetheless. The great sin of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is often spoken of very lightly and in a very trifling spirit, he says, as though it were scarcely any sin at all. Yet, according to this text, and, and indeed according to the whole tenor of the scripture, Unbelief is the giving of God the lie. And what can be worse? It is a rejection. And it is dangerous. And this continued rejection of God's word will lead to hard hearts. The more and more that you reject him, the more you call him a liar, the more your hearts will harden to him, regardless of the excuse you made. I, I wanted to believe, but it was, it was just too hard. Or I wanted to believe, and, and I just can't. Now, you're really saying, I don't want to believe. I don't want God in my life. I don't believe in him. Therefore, you say, he is alive. Now, having told us of the importance of accepting the testimony, now John looks to make it clear what this testimony is in verse 11, doesn't he? And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. This is God's essential message for us, the offer of eternal life for all who are found in God. But what does this message mean? It's more than just living forever. It means eternity in the presence of God. This gift from God is a, is a future with him in perfection, a future of praising him with everything we do, a future where we can know him intimately. These are the things that God testifies to us through his word and through his son. And we should know these things, and we should have them impact us on a deep, deep level. Whoever has the Son, he says, has life. And whoever does not, does not have life. And the testimony of God doesn't just contain promises, does it, of life. There's also the promise of life away from him. Clark says, it is vain to expect eternal glory if we have not Christ in our hearts. The indwelling Christ gives both a title to it and a meekness for it. This is God's record. Let no man deceive himself here. An indwelling Christ and glory. 
No indwelling Christ, no glory. God's record must stand. It is serious to hear these things, to think about them. There is a warning in this testimony. And we should think about it seriously, whether we believe in it or not. For believing in it, well, it brings great promises in a relationship with God. Rejecting it, it calls God a liar. It leads to no glory and no life. And so the question remains, what do you believe in? Do you believe in the world around you and the things that it tells you? Do you believe in the empty promises that lead to a lack of fulfillment? Or do you believe in the Lord? Do you believe in the rebirth that only comes from God that has been spoken about this morning and in Jesus' teaching during his earthly life? Do you believe that you need that personal relationship with God? Do you believe in the facts of history that have been shown in the historical accounts of the Bible as well as other ancient historians? Do you see what God has made clear through history? Do you believe the Lord for his continued work? And finally, do you believe in the testimony that has been laid before you by God in the Bible? This is the testimony of Scripture. Do you believe in it? Do you believe in the word of God, the only one who is completely trustworthy? Do you believe in the things that he has said in his word and through his son and through his spirit? Do you believe that you need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and that by having him in your life, there will be an eternity with the Father and glory forever? If you believe in these things, will be pushed on to tell other people. But, if you don't believe these things yet, ask questions. Read Scripture. Talk with those who do believe about the truths that are laid before you in history. And come to the Lord and find life in Him. Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for your word and we pray that we would be challenged now to think on who we trust in, who we believe in, Lord. And Father, we thank you for these words of John that point us to Jesus, that point us to new life, that point us to the, the facts of history and the truth of Scripture, Lord. And we pray that it would impact us, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand over to our final song now.
Well, let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time around your word, and we pray, Lord, that you would be with us now as we go out from here. We pray that you would challenge us with this word and that you would, you would leave us thinking today as we head back out into the world. Father, we pray that you would challenge us to look to you for all we need. Amen. Amen. Well, do come and join us as we close our series next week with the last section of 1 John. God bless. <laughs>